All right, next I'm happy to introduce Tim Parker, who will be talking about using the same data, different analysts, variation in effect sizes due to analytical decisions in ecology and evolutionary biology. Okay, thanks very much, David. Let's see, it's the green button for advancing. Oop, I just, I can go back, there we go. Okay, um, before I get started, I want to um, acknowledge my co-authors. There are many. I especially want to acknowledge um, Elliot Gould, who's a grad student who's done a huge amount of the work on this, pro on this, uh, this project and is here today. I also want to um, acknowledge the sort of two other uh, co-leaders of this project, um, Hannah Frazier and Shinichi Nakagawa. And then I, of course, want to mention that um, this work wouldn't have been possible without uh, more than 200 um, different analysts and, uh, and peer reviewers. Okay, so biologists have, ecologists in particular, ecologists and evolutionary biologists have known for a long time that there's a tremendous amount of variability among studies in results. Uh, this was actually quantified a few years ago um, in this paper that was uh, essentially a meta-analysis of meta-analyses. Um, and this paper showed that um, heterogeneity as measured by I squared, which is a common measure of heterogeneity in meta-analysis, um, among the heterogeneity within individual meta-analyses in ecology and evolutionary biology was really very, very high. A typical um, median I squared value of, of about 85%, which is um, a lot of differences among studies that are putatively studying uh, the same topic. Um, so biologists, like I said, biologists er, and ecologists have known for a long time that there's a lot of variability among studies, and frankly, they are not surprised by this fact. Um, if, you know, if you went to these four, take a look at these four different grasslands from different parts of the world, um, and, you know, you went and did the same experiment in those four different grasslands, I think most ecologists would expect you to get different results because these systems are qualitatively different from each other. Um, they are noticeably different just from looking at this photo, and they're biologically different from each other. Um, I think most, most ecologists have assumed that when they go out and they get different results, that their results are attributable to what we might call true biological heterogeneity. The biological world is heterogeneous, so of course our results are heterogeneous. Um, but uh, ecologists also differ tremendously in, uh, in the methods they use, and so, um, so uh, methodological heterogeneity is a plausible explanation for the heterogeneity and results that they observe. Um, and of course, uh, what we're going to talk about today is analytical heterogeneity. Different uh, ecologists analyze their, different, uh, analyze their data in different ways. And so um, probably, again, a potential source of, of heterogeneity um, in results. So um, uh, there have been a number since uh, the 2018 uh, Silverzahn et al. paper, um, which uh, uh, sort of introduced many of us to the concept of of many analyst projects. There have been several that have been published. Um, what unites all these papers is that uh, a, a, a data set is provided to a large group of analysts. The analysts are invited to analyze the data set to answer a pre-specified question. And then what we see is a lot of variability in the results um, provided by those analysts, even though they're using the same data um, and being asked to answer the same question. Um, we um, were inspired to do something similar in ecology and evolutionary biology. And um, so we used, uh, we identified two data sets and um, asked a particular biological question to each of those data sets. So two data sets, two questions. Um, our first question um, was this, to what extent is the growth of nestling blue tits, these are a, a, a small European songbird, to what extent is the growth of nestling blue tits influenced by competition with siblings? So this is kind of maybe in the realm of evolutionary, what might be called evolutionary ecology. 79 teams submitted analyses um, with a total of 132 usable effect sizes. Our, our second question was um, what, from a discipline we might call restoration ecology. Um, these data were from, uh, and it's related to data from Australia. So the question was, how does grass cover influence eucalyptus species? Um, eucalyptus uh, seedling recruitment, so how, basically how does grass cover um, influencing the um, recovery of, of woodland communities um, in former agricultural lands? 
Uh, 68 teams submitted analyses uh, with a total of 80 usable effects. Okay, so what do our results look like? Well, the short answer is, like those studies in social science and, 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 uh, and neuroscience, um, our results um, vary uh, quite a bit. Um, so this is a forest plot. Um, each dot there on the plot, each of those blue dots is a different effect size um, submitted to us by um, an analysis, an analyst, pardon me. Let's see, what's the, uh, this, yeah, there we go. So um, our, on our uh, x-axis there is uh, the standardized effect size that's commonly used um, in ecolo ecological and evolutionary biological meta-analyses on Fisher's Z-transformation. Um, of the correlation coefficient R. You can pretty much think about this as a, as, um, a cor uh, as a correlation coefficient R that's just unbounded, so it's just, um, anyway, I won't say anything more about it, but um, zero would be a no effect, so uh, essentially a correlation of zero between um, our target variables, and what you can see is that, um, is that effect sizes submitted range from quite large um, you know, almost approaching a value that would, uh, in, in, in a correlation coefficient, would be 0. 0.8, which is very strong in ecology and evolutionary biology, um, down to uh, null effects to effects in the opposite than predicted direction. Um, and one of the things that was quite surprising to us is that when we use um, heterogeneity, this I-squared measure of, of heterogeneity, um, we actually get um, a, a really, really high value that's even higher than the, the averages we saw um, in the meta meta um, anal, uh, meta meta analysis. Okay, um, here are our data from um, from the the, the eucalyptus um, data set. Uh, this uh, uh, this distribution looks looks different. Um, here's uh, uh, the average effect size of this dashed line. It's relatively close to zero. Um, and there are uh, effects that are, appear to be bigger than zero and effects that appear to be smaller than zero. Um, and there are some really striking outliers. Uh, I'm not going to say a lot about those outliers other than that they're pretty much, I'm happy to talk to you more about them, but they're pretty much related to uh, folks who um, chose to analyze subsets of the data rather than, rather than, the, enti in the, rather than the entire data set. Um, our, uh, uh, let's see, our, hmm. I don't remember what I did with it. Uh, there it is, yeah. Um, our our uh, I squared value is again quite high. If we remove these substantial outliers, our I squared value remains relatively high, um, but it, it do, does um, uh, reduce notably. Okay, so there are, I think, two basic questions that might be inspired by seeing, uh, by seeing these data. Um, one is just, why do we see such substantial heterogeneity? This would be the same question we would ask from, from other many analyst studies. Um, and the other question we might ask is, why does the pattern of heterogeneity differ notably between these two data sets? Okay, so in, tr in trying to answer the first one, I'm not going to give you a comprehensive answer. I'm just going to jump through a few, um, th few things here um, really quickly. Um, one possibility is that there's variation in quality of analyses. Um, so I don't really think that that's happening here. So we had peer reviewers look at these analyses. And, they're, and, and rate them, and they rated them from deeply flawed and unpublishable all the way to publishable as is. And you can see that there's not really any variability in effect size there. Um, so uh, overall, that, that I squared, as I already told you, was 98%. Um, if we cut out any study that received at least one rating, and all these were rated four times, if it received at least one rating of deeply flawed and unpublishable, um, we removed it, and that left us with an I squared of 75%. Um, if we also cut out uh, uh, publishable uh, with m major revisions, that doesn't really change anything. And this is just for the tree data set. When we look at the bird data set, when we cut these out, we really see no change at all in the I squared. So looks like um, variation in analytical quality is not a substantial explanation here. Um, there are a small number. So another possibility is that there's a small number of variables with large and divergent, uh, large effects and um, divergent um, effects. Uh, this, again, doesn't really seem to be the case. There was one, um, there's this one uh, set of contrasts, this is with the blue tits, one set of contrasts that are really associated with uh, weak or negative effects, but um, not so much for any of the others, um, which are widespread across a, an array of effects. 
So I think probably, um, this is just a quick summary, I think probably what we're looking at is what some previous authors of these types of studies have argued is that it's accumulation of a lot of different small decisions that are leading to these patterns. Okay, so why does the heterogeneity differ between these two data sets? Um, this is gonna be very short, I don't know. Um, I mean, it's really very interesting. We're looking at um, following this up and trying to figure out why this might be the case, but I don't have an answer for you right now. Um, so what do we wanna do with this? Um, first, I, I hope that, um, that ecologists take note of this um, and become aware of the, the fact that their different analytical choices may have big impacts on their outcomes. Um, and I hope that it leads to facilitation of discussion in these disciplines uh, about whether um, and how analytical practices should change um, in response um, to this sort of information. And I'd be happy to take questions if there's time. We have time for two questions. Regarding your last point about discussion, um, have you offered these analysts the uh, opportunity to look at what others have done? And do people revise, would they revise their approaches in, in that case? So we did not, in this study, we did not offer analysts the opportunity um, to, uh, to see what other people have done. I mean, certainly, uh, you know, a, at least one previous mini analyst study did that, and people did, um, you know, did revise, uh, but that wasn't part of our study. So, Thanks. yeah. <clears throat> yeah, just a short question. There's, there seems to be uh, one, one effect and one null effect, and in the case of the effect, there's more heterogeneity than in the null effect. Uh, I think that's been observed in social science, or at least in psychology as well. Uh, Olson Collentine, for example, uh, observes that with actual direct replications. Um, did you, uh, do you have any thoughts on, on the possible correlation? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that that is a real possibility, that that could be what we're looking at, just that there's, you know, that there's, um, that there just aren't strong relationships, you know, latent anywhere in the data to drive big effect sizes, and so the effect sizes are all gonna hang out around zero. I think that is really quite plausible. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much.